When you're working hard to make your small business thrive, you don't have to do it alone. Verity Credit Union is your partner in helping you reach your goals. We can meet you where you are with checking options, loans, and more. We're here for you because we realize it's hard out there. And when you need support, you can lean on us to ask questions and create a plan. Because in the end, we know that you can see your future. And now, there's a credit union that can see it with you. Verity Credit Union, your future, your partner. Visit veritycu.com to learn more. Federally insured by NCUA. Texting privacy policy and terms and conditions posted at textplan.us. Texting enrolls for occurring automated text marketing messages. Message data rates may apply. Reply stop, stop, stop. Does this noise sound painfully familiar to you? Here's the thing you need to know about snoring. It could be a sign of a very big health problem called sleep apnea. People with sleep apnea have been found to be at an increased risk for serious health conditions like coronary heart disease and other cardiovascular diseases. And studies show that as many as 80% of all sleep apnea cases go undiagnosed. If you or loved one think you have sleep apnea, you need to know before it's too late. Here's the good news. Now you can find out if you have sleep apnea quickly and easily right from the comfort of your own home with no expensive or time-consuming doctor visits or overnight sleep lab stays required. Just send one simple text to get started. Text QUIET to 323232 to get a private link to the sleep apnea quiz. Text QUIET to 323232. It takes just minutes and could literally save your life. Don't wait. Text QUIET to 323232 now. Text the word QUIET to 323232. Text QUIET to 323232. We made this. Welcome back to Partisan, a podcast discussing politics and history and film and entertainment only on the We Made This podcast network. I'm your host, Tony Black, and I'm joined in this episode by uh, two guests, recurring uh, guest star Carl Swinney of the Movie Palace podcast and writer and podcaster Dee Malumbi to continue our conversation about Andrew Dominic's uh, adaptation of Joyce Carol Oates' Blonde, uh, her novel from 2000, uh, all about the life and tragic death of uh, Marilyn Monroe. So, guys, yeah, welcome back. Um, we're going to talk a bit more. We've talked, uh, we've set up essentially what we think of the movie, uh, our, our basic thoughts about Blonde. So let's let's get a little bit more into the details of the film then. So how much do you guys know about Blonde's production history? Because it's it, it, it goes back quite a while, actually. I don't know much. Um, I know that Blonde had already been adapted as a miniseries, hadn't it? Um, much closer to the time of the publication of the book. But I haven't seen the first adaptation. In terms of this film, am I right in thinking that they went to as many places that Monroe had actually um, you know, been in as they could, including the room where she died to film? Is that right? Well, apparently, and and there's there's some there's going to be some really interesting myth making here going on. But they filmed the death scene of Marilyn with Anna at the Armas, obviously, in the room Marilyn Monroe died, which I think is utterly ghoulish. Yeah, uh, that's <laughs> like, exactly the word I was thinking of. Ghoulish. Uh, is that entirely necessary? Uh, like, really? Yeah, I know, I know. It, w- why was that not recreated on the soundstage? If you know, if, if they couldn't find a you know a good replica. It's it's a really strange. I think there might have been some scenes as well that were filmed in the house she lived at with her mum when she was very young as well, uh, possibly, and certain recreations there, which which is is one thing. But then, yeah, filming her death where she died, and and there's there's and this is going to enter movie folklore. But there is talk that Marilyn was haunting the production. Apparently, that there were points where there were literally paintings and and or or pictures flying off the wall poltergeist style when there were certain scenes that were quite emotional and quite uh, significant for her life and Anna de Armas and Andrew Dominic have both spoken about how they they believe she was there and Anna, Anna, Anna de Armas says I they 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 stop short just and only just at suggesting that she might have even possessed Anna de Armas's performance but that there are <laughs> there are a lot of there are a lot of suggestions that that there were points where she transformed in such a way as Marilyn that she felt her. She said she was in my dreams. You know, she was. But I mean, you could. You. I mean, I would describe that if if I put my um my Dana Scully hat on as, as opposed to my Fox Mulder hat on, I would describe that to the fact she was so immersed in this role and all of the research and all of the books she read and all of the videos she watched. A bit like how, and and it's again it's not maybe the most tasteful example, but how Heath Ledger really, really became the Joker not long before he died. It's one of those immersive kind of roles where you just lose yourself a little bit in the part. 
I guess. Mm, I think there's a problem with that though, in the in the sense that it's it's definitely a performance. It's it, the performance pushes it closer to biopic territory, I think, than than comes across in the book because she is mimicking Monroe quite closely. I think there are limitations to it. Like she has the breathy voice all of the time. I think one of the things that was really interesting, um, I saw a, a piece that had a link to a Marilyn Monroe press conference that she gave. And the real Monroe didn't always have the, that exact timbre in her voice. You know, she, she was a bit sturdier when she was talking naturally, um, but that doesn't come across in, in the Armas's performance. I think what the performance does uh, and what the film does, the film reads as being more specifically about Marilyn Monroe than in the book, where it's very obvious that she's being used as a symbol. So I think th- that contributes to some of the discourse around this, and I found it a problem. I think in the book you get the sense that uh, Joyce Carol Oates is making lots of points about you know um, fame and the way women are treated in Hollywood, and the film is doing that to some extent, but I think they, the things that happen to Monroe register as horrific things that specifically happened to Marilyn Monroe and the broader picture gets um, closed off a bit, I think. That's what I found. Yeah, I, I, can, I can see that. I can see that, really. I think that they're, they're, looking back, though, he's uh, just just a little in terms of the production, he he was trying to make this for over 10 years after he read, after he, he, he read the book. And there were various points he was struggling to get financing for the movie. Back in 2010, I think, it was slated to be Naomi Watts playing this part it, 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 which is surprising given she I think had she just done Diana by that point or was she it was around that point she was doing the Diana movie I think so I'm surprised she wanted to jump into another quite you know iconic <laughs> immersive figure and then he couldn't get the money efficiently enough to, to make it she dropped out then it was going to be Jessica Chastain apparently as Marilyn who I who I could see a bit more in this in a way. I mean, I I, th- I think Watts could have done it, but I think Jessica Chastain might have been quite remarkable actually in this role, in a different way to Diarmas. But again, he couldn't get the money. Eventually, Netflix came in and picked it up, and uh, there's been a big push pull between him and them. I think for quite some time, and this I think this was supposed to come out in in 2020 originally, as was No Time to Die, and you know, because they were filmed similar in, in, in a similar uh, time frame. But for various reasons, this took time, not just because of COVID, but I think there was a back and forth about just how much Dominic could get away with. I think there was probably even more explicit stuff that was left on the cutting room floor in the end than we actually do get here in, in the long in the long term. And this is quite explicit, and there's certain scenes I'm sure we'll come to that really push the boundaries of what I think people expect to see in a film like this. And... So, so I think I think it was controver- it's been controversial for a while. It's been on the radar for a while, and it took him a long time to make it. And and there was a good point made about how now Netflix are having it having to have a rethink of their strategy in line of losing subscribers and with all of the other streaming services that are now competing with them, like Disney and you know Apple and all these people. That maybe this was commissioned, I think, in 2016 officially by Netflix. And a few people have said, I don't think they, that he would have been given the money by mm-hmm. them now to make a film like this in this climate, in this in this you know climate. You know, Blonde may never have been made in that sense, and I find that very interesting that it took so long. And having seen the film, does it make sense? D, do you think that it took that long to get a film like this off the ground? Yeah, absolutely, because it is. Um, it's not a straightforward um, biopic. Now, I haven't read the. Um source material myself so I can't really comment on it uh, but from what you guy, guys have described and um, you know in terms of like the kind of psychoanalytic stuff that um, that is present in the book and obviously makes its way into the film as well um, no I can absolutely see why that is and I mean there's some stuff in Blonde that is really really horrific and really difficult to watch so I'm not surprised to be honest when you say that there could have been worse content there that might have been um, cut out because particularly when it comes to the scenes of, you know, essentially what is what is sexual assault and rape. Like those are the scenes that really kind of stood out to me as just really, really horrible and distressing to watch. And, um, you know, in a way I was also thinking, um, you know, because I, I, I always see film and I think you know most people who um, you know are really interested in kind of you know um, watching films not just as 
entertainment, but in analysing them and stuff like that, you have to kind of interpret them as not just um, commentary, not just commenting on who they're about and the era they're set in, but also reflective of the current times. And Blonde is very much a, a post Me Too movie. So I think in that way, it also kind of speaks to um, this uh, contemporary era and maybe um, like you're, like you were saying, AJ, like maybe back then it would have almost been too close to what was emerging at that time for a movie like this to come out. But now there's been a little more time and a little more healing, uh, particularly with, um, you know, Harvey Weinstein, um, who really became kind of the figure of that whole thing, um, getting his uh, comeuppance and everything, um, you know. I think that's another reason why um, we're seeing this movie now. Um, I also wonder, did possibly the pandemic delay in it getting released and also the fact that it is so long, like it is very um, like, like you said, there were obviously scenes there and I can imagine very readily there being a back and forth between uh, Dominic and Netflix when it came to that final edit, because at the end of the day, it's a two hour, 45 minute, 47 or whatever minute movie. It's a long movie. Um, so that would also make sense as to why it was delayed. I suppose there could be a myriad mm, of reasons. There probably are you know? really. I think in terms of what you say about me too, I think that's absolutely true. And there's the, the, the scene that really I thought was was really haunting was the moment when she's having dinner with um, Joe DiMaggio, although they're not named in the film or in the book, these people. You have to look at the history. That's her, her, her second husband, Joe DiMaggio. In the book, he's the ex-athlete he's known as. And he, he says, how did you get your start? And she flashes back to when she's raped by... Um, Mr. Z, as he's known in the book, that's actually Daryl F. Zanuck, what the, the head of the studio at the time. Um, it's just a horrific scene where you, that you see. And it's just really, that's really haunting. And that obviously is, 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 is it, it, it's the kind of thing that Harvey Weinstein was put in jail for, you know, and that, and that it was a completely different era in that the suggestion is that she, she got her start because she was raped, essentially, and that was her audition. So, so there are there are scenes in this, and that's not even the one I think that has courted the most controversy. I think the one that the most controversy is the Kennedy scene at the end, yeah, um, which is the the blowjob scene. I mean, it, it it's it's juxtaposed with a real, almost perverse sense of black humor, isn't it? In that he's watching the launch of a rocket, and you literally see as as he puts his head, he puts her head into his crotch. You see this rocket rise up on the TV, and I mean, I didn't laugh at that. In my head, I was, I was, I, I laughed at the, at the, 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 how could, at, at almost that, how can he make that joke at that point, you know, in the, cause it is, it's very clear. I mean, apparently it's historical record that it's, it's trying to date the, the assumed, you know, assignation between them at, at the, the law, I think it was called the friendship rocket, the friendship one rocket in 1962. But at the same time, it's a, it's a perverse joke. And it's that kind of thing that I understand why people are sickened by. Not not just the fact that you see her quite clearly, you know, being forced to, you know, give the president a blowjob, but also the fact that it could juxtapose those things. And I think that's potentially one of the reasons why this, is, this has not gone down well in some quarters. And I see, I do see that. I do see that. And you wonder, is that, was that, was that scene completely necessary to sell the decline of, of Marilyn that was going on at that point in the film? I, I, it's a bit, it's a good question, really. I mean, I suppose um, uh, just, just touching on that particular scene, because it is, um, it, it is really, you know, quite, um, you know, remarkable in all the wrong senses of the word. Um, but two things I'd, I'd, I'd point out about that is I suppose, firstly, it's, it's kind of well, like, known and documented that there was something going on between, um, you know, Monroe and Kennedy as much as, you know, all the official administrations and powers that be have um, denied it and everything. Um, but I suppose it, it was the first time I've seen or read anyway about that relationship possibly being like non-consensual. So I think that in that way, it's a particularly like, you know, it's like an oh my God kind of reaction to seeing something like that. Um, because I suppose there's kind of the glamour of like, oh, you know, it's Kennedy and he's the president and stuff like that. Um, so I suppose there is that kind of, you know, association with it um, that would be like really quite appalling because it's kind of completely turning on its head. You know, the idea of the dream boy president doing something horrific. 
And then the second point that I'd make about that scene, which, look, I may be giving Andrew Dominic way too much credit here, but for me anyway, the association of watching it was it reminded me of something almost Hitchcockian, you know, like the end of, um, you know, North by Northwest or something where you have the yeah. train going into the cu- yeah. tunnel yeah. when uh, Cary Grant, you know, finally gets to cons- consummate his love. And I was almost like wondering, is that a Hitchcock reference? Because as we know, Hitchcock at the time was like lauded as this absolutely, you know, amazing figure and author and still is in like a large sense. And it's only kind of emerged in recent years. And I think that people still don't talk enough about the fact that Hitchcock did some really um, horrific things to like some of his, um, you know, um, some of the actresses that he worked in, in terms of like, you know, intimidating and harassing them and stuff like that. Um, So I was almost wondering if it's a nod to that, but I may again be giving it way more credit than it's due. And that might have been just an association that completely came up in my head and may just be fabricated but that was just something that I suppose came to my yeah. mind anyway well no it came into my I actually thought of North by Northwest too at that moment and I think because it's very old Hollywood psychologizing in a way what this film does in the sense that it all seems to stem from um these daddy issues that she's got going on so it's quite it's quite facile I think the book does a lot of that too and I felt this was one of the weaker aspects of the book but yeah I think what's going on is um He's the president, so he's kind of the father of the nation. You have she's in the relationship earlier with the sons of famous Hollywood figures in in the body of uh, Cha- Chaplin and uh, Edward G. Robinson. Um, then you have people like Arthur Miller who are old enough to be a father. So it's it's the thing that's going running through the film. To return to Tony's point about Netflix, this is where I find myself kind of wanting to defend the film almost, even though I didn't like it that much, which is like. I think it's good that we're getting weird, auteur-driven stuff funded by Netflix and, um, you know, released in this way. So, yeah, I, I wasn't saying earlier that this is like a traditional biopic. I'm just saying that I think the the Armas performance pushes it a little bit closer to that than the book was. So, yeah, even though I didn't appreciate this film in a lot of ways, I, I want to see more films that take a swing like this, you know. And so that's why so much of a discourse being, you can't watch this, you shouldn't watch this, um, I find kind of ridiculous. Um, yeah, in terms of the sexuality, I think that's what's so interesting about it is that um, sexuality was very important to Monroe's on-screen image, wasn't it? It's not to say that she wasn't many other things too, but I think the idea of her on screen as a very sexual woman is quite a dominant part of that image. You know, she starts off as a pinup. She's dis- defined by her sexual appeal to men in many of those films. She's often seen through the eyes of male characters. Reviewers often wrote about her in quite sexualized language and things like that. Um so yeah, seeing this kind of Me Too era take on her is kind of a subversion then, isn't it? Because I think the original idea was that she was overtly sexual, but natural with it, spontaneous with it. Um, and this is kind of holding up a dark mirror to that, isn't it? So I think that's very uncomfortable for people. Um, I found that the film was kind of trapped in some ways. I felt like Although it's trying to critique the way she was sexualized, it also sexualizes her. And I felt like Mm -hmm. that balance wasn't quite right. Yeah, I I get that. I think it, it, it definitely tries to amp up the daddy stuff. In that, I mean, it's I say amp it up. It's it like you said, it's all there in Oates's book. It's right there from the very beginning. But in in the book. It it conflates that really with this idea of her being in this dark fairy tale. You know, she right right at the very beginning when she's a child, you know, and she's she loves movies as a child, and she she watch it. Well, the first movie she watches is is a, a fairy tale story about a fair princess and a, and a dark prince, and the, and all through the book, the dark prince, it's almost like she's she's looking for the dark prince, and the dark prince is conflated with her father figure, and in the book, the father figure is she's convinced the father figure is one of the great iconic you know early film actors you know the the silent era actors which is why in the book when she's having this and in the and there's way more done with this in the book but when she's having this tryst with uh Cass Chaplin and Eddie G Eddie G Jr who are the sons of these these Hollywood legends who are apparently horrific abusive evil fathers we never see them but that's what the sons Mm -hmm. consider them to be and it's known as in the book as the Gemini, and it's this idea that that Norma, as she's known to them, Norma Jean, is because this is largely before she becomes Marilyn Monroe, and the idea is that she she believes that her father is one of these great icons. She just doesn't know who he is because her mother 
do, point he doesn't get tell her you know she points to a picture and says look Norma Jean that's your father but it's not it's not anyone she she recognizes or understands and it all the way through the book she's and that and that's bookended in in the in the novel as well and it to make to make it very clear and I mean all through the book the book tries to suggest it might be Clark Gable which is then brought into you know well clearer when it's when she's filming the misfits with him which is his final movie and and so there's lots of myth around that, but it it conflates her story with this idea that she's she, she's in this fairy tale and that she's never. And I think the film does this a bit, but it's the idea that she's never really grown up. I think I think I re- I really got that in the scene. I think with in the scenes with DiMaggio, where he turns out to be quite. It, it, he's 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 the really almost cliched stock American male of the 1940s and 1950s. You know, he's a little bit older than her. He likes his sports. He's quite abusive. He he takes the back of his hand to her when she's, you know, when he thinks that she's being, you know, lewd or anything like that. It's almost a cliche. And and I think in that scene though, where she where he comes home and he hits her around the face because, you know, he thinks he thinks she's been lewd and that kind of thing. She she's then she sort of curls up and into a ball and she's like, "Oh daddy, I'm sorry." And and it, it it's creepy. But I think is it quite surface level? I think. Whereas in the book, it, it's very, it, 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 like I say, it conflates with all these different things going on, and I, I found it richer in the book, even though it's a very simple sort of Oedipal idea. But in the film, like you said, Carl, she sort of bounces from the these different these different men, and and it's almost like she's leading up to the the most the most oblique and toxic version of that, which is Kennedy. You know, she goes she goes from the the, like I said, the stock baseball player to the thoughtful but older daddy figure of Miller, then to Kennedy, who who to, ultimately to Kennedy, she's a prostitute essentially by the end of the film. That that's what the film suggests her to be. So it's the, the descent tracks with these men. Whereas in the book, I mean, there's a whole there's a whole marriage that that the, the film never even goes near that is in the book, and and a whole life before she gets to be in Marilyn. And I and I understand to some level why he cut that because you could have ended up with a four hour movie. But on the other, it almost it's almost like the film really goes in for this idea at the expense of of maybe fleshing out some of the other I think more interesting psychological ideas that could have been conveyed on screen. I don't know. I don't. I I I, I know. I know it might be difficult if as you haven't read the book, D to to. to to see that like like I like I do in that way, but I think, did you feel there was anything missing here in it? Not necessarily in that sense, but in sense of how she's characterised and and that kind of thing. I mean, I definitely agree with you in that the whole all she ever really wanted was a father is it's a bit simplistic and it's definitely the driving point for the movie really from start to finish. And um, like you were saying, with regards to all of her relationships um and i would agar- i would argue that's not even just with men there's also that scene um which i thought was quite interesting in which we see her you know surrounded by her you know makeup artists and all of these um these other people who are kind of like supporting her and they're just they're not particularly kind to her they're just kind of praising her and stuff like that when she's trying to open up to the, her to them they're kind of undermining her a bit um i can't remember a verbatim but but do you know the scene that i'm talking about um to be honest i couldn't i couldn't make myself watch the movie a second time even in preparation <laughs> for this podcast i was like yeah. i need a breather yeah, yeah. after that Fair um enough. but i just thought i just thought that that was quite an interesting scene um because the film really doesn't show her to have relationships with um any women i suppose no. the whole idea is you know the relationship with her mother kind of wound all her um you know future relationships with women and i think it's a shame that for example it doesn't get um the film negates to talk about her relationship with uh lee strasberg and lee's wife which i believe was very um um close and uh, a good um kind of positive uh, relationship for her i thought that that was something that as well that was lacking in the film um but yeah i'd agree with you in that as much as it's going into kind of the psychoanalytical stuff it's doing it in a very simplistic way with the whole father figure thing and then it emerges that you know all those letters were just made up and stuff like that I just thought ugh, I don't know it did it did irk me a bit um, because those letters are all fictionalised aren't they they're just put in for yeah. 
kind of giving as, the movie a conclusion. As isn't far it? as I know, I mean that's in the book, isn't it, Carl? But as mm. far as I know, that's not that whole idea that Cass Chaplin was writing these letters pretending to be a dad yeah. is not real. I don't think that's true at all. Yeah, I, as far as I know, that's right. And um, again, I should, probably shouldn't harp on about the book too much, but I think the book frames it a bit better by it starts with this author's note saying, "Look, this is not where you're going to find biographical fact." This is not intended as a historical document, you know, and the, the fact that um, Arthur Miller is never named, the fact that Joe DiMaggio is never named. I think there are devices that she uses in the book that really do encourage you to think of it as a symbolic tale. Whether, you know, wh- whether Marilyn Monroe is too frequently reduced to a symbol is another discussion. But I think the film puts that, uh, sorry, the book puts that idea across much better than the film does. Um, it's worth stressing to people who haven't seen it, isn't it, that it, what the experience of watching this film really is like watching a horror film, isn't it? I think one of the films, mm-hmm. I really like the Pablo Lorraine comparison, actually, because uh, I hadn't thought of that. But the film I was thinking of a lot of the time was um, Twin Peaks Fire Walk With Me. You oh, know, yeah, that's good. It's reminiscent mm. of the, what, that, what, that, what that film does with the last week of um, Laura Palmer's life in that from that series. Um, but yeah, no, there are scenes like where um, Marilyn goes to visit her mother in a hospital and it almost feels like Clarice Starling being led in to see Hannibal Lecter. Do you know what I mean? There's um, a real grotesqueness to the way that leering men are filmed. So again, it's where I'm finding the film kind of caught between two impulses, really. is like the way that that seven-year itch moment is filmed. You know, the film is really trying to say to you how Marilyn was objectified and positioned as a sex object for men. So the seven-year itch... Um, thing we see this is where she stood over the um what do you call it like the grate in the street storm drain yeah yeah, yeah. um and we mm-hmm. go to repeated shots of that moment don't we we see the um photographers in slow motion again leering so the film is emphasizing you know um this sense of marilyn as a sex object um who's having these things done to her I don't know. I think it. I think it went too far that way, and I, I can understand why people who are very invested in Marilyn Monroe, and like you say, dear, the fact that she had friendships with other women, the fact that she was quite witty, and things that, that you know, she had attributes that don't really shine through in this film. And I know it's not trying to provide a holistic take on, you know, what she was like as a person necessarily, um, but I think there is a lack of. There's a lack of nuance there for me that got in the way. Yeah, I, I'd agree. And especially um, like, for example, just touching on what you were saying about the the seven year itch moment, the fact that I can't remember how many scenes later, but then la- but there is then another scene afterwards where she's on the red carpet mm-hmm. and um, the camera pans across the, the crowd of male photographers and their mouths yeah, are yeah. doing this surreal kind of wide, like gapy thing. And I think they already kind of made that point with the seven year itch moment. I don't think that that was really entirely necessary. It felt a bit... Um, uh, excessive to me and then what you were touching on with regards to how the film doesn't go into enough how smart she was like there are a couple of moments where people are surprised oh you've read that book oh you've read that play and I feel like that was kind of their way of saying, oh, she was actually smart. But again, it's just so fleeting, isn't it? Yeah. It's simplistic. It's it's like they've they've kind of it's it's lacking in nuance in certain respects and then completely lacks nuance where it should have it if that makes sense um i just feel like there there are certain missteps with um the way that andrew dominic um handles different aspects of um who marilyn monroe Mm. was well i think that's a good point that you make about um there are moments where her ambition shines through there are moments when she is seen as joyous or at least happy for a time so one good scene i thought was when she's on the phone to somebody and it's kind of haggling a bit or pushing a bit on the idea that Jane Russell's um, being paid more for gentlemen prefer blondes. At least you see her sort of trying to take control a bit there. I think the film never sustains that very, very frequently. So when she meets Arthur Miller, you get quite a nice sequence there where she's um, uh, content for a while, uh, but repeatedly it undercuts that, doesn't it? And um, it just grows wearying, I found, and increasingly so as the film proceeds, you know, because you know it's not going to get any better. And in fact, it gets a great deal worse. Um, again, I think that's the point. I think that's what Dominic's trying to convey. I think as a as a viewing experience, it didn't come off for me because I didn't find myself really immersed. I found myself kind of coolly 
detached from a lot of this. Maybe how much of that is to do with the stylistic affectations he pulls off, I wonder, because it switches from like widescreen to uh, four, four, three ratio, like and other ratios as well. It switches from color to black and white again and again and again. I don't know. Did either of you find those things were like barriers to you or did you, did you like that, uh, that tack? Well, I was going to ask this actually of you guys, you know, in terms of the visual side, because I think if it, I personally think if, if the film is, is at its strongest, it's when it's trying things on a visual level to, tr- to attempt to, I, I mean, I, I don't necessarily understand why he moves from color to black and white in the way he does all the time. I don't necessarily know why, what, what the choices were there. I almost want to sit down with him and have him explain to me why sometimes he moves between colour and black and white in almost the same scene or almost the same sequence. And I'm not quite sure about that. And, and But I think, you know, there, there are some, I think there are some really interesting visual touches. You know, I think the, the way he shoots the, uh, the threesome with Cass and Eddie G and how mm-hmm. the bodies morph into each other and it almost, it is a bit Lynchian. You funny you should mention that actually, or Cronenbergian. It's that idea that those that those three sort of tormented souls, you know, lost children morph together into this amorphous, weird, you know, blob together. I think, you know, that's really interesting. I really, I I, I find, you know, it, it's horrific in a way, but the way he pulls away from the, the blowjob to, the, to a cinema watching her giving this blowjob and then goes back in. You know, those are really interesting visual ideas, I think, that he's doing. I think he's trying to convey this, this story and and what what we're seeing in a in a I mean I'd almost liked him to be even more surrealist in a way though and even more discordant with it at points I I feel like he could have gone even further in a way and and you know he's I think he talked about how he wanted to strip back the dialogue as much as possible and make it more visual but there is a, there is still a lot of dialogue there are still a lot of sequences where he pushes in on Marilyn doing like in the um, uh, the actor sort of studio sequences you know or when she's auditioning for. And and I get it because Diarmas is great, you know. She's doing so much with her face, particularly at points, as well as her voice, which is excellent, you know. So I understand why he does that. So it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a a, a dichotomy on that. I mean, I, I think I I also what, what do you what do you guys think about um the insertion of Diarmas into particular classic Marilyn scenes because he does that at various points, and part of it was because he couldn't get the rights to certain things for a while. And um, hence, that's one of the reasons they filmed the Some Like It Hot sequence completely new, because they couldn't quite get the rights to do it in the same way. And there's there's various different juxtapositions there. I mean, what do you guys think about that? No, I think that it does work in certain scenes. I actually, yeah, I quite liked the, um, <laughs> that makes it sound weird, but I did like the threesome scene. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> I thought no, but I did. I, I I'd agree with you, Tony, in that I do think that it really did work uh, visually, and I liked that. Um, another thing I could kind of appreciate it was the fact that um, you know you really do feel because um, it's articulated not just through the performances but visually that she's truly happy in this relationship, and I just thought that it was very interesting um, as well. Kind of speaking about it more broadly, in that you don't get many positive depictions of polyamorous relationships. There's always you know someone gets jealous or whatever, but these three together, they did seem to be like, you know, the way the, the film has interpreted any anyway, just really kind of happy together and that it just worked, you know, the three of them. It was kind of the the most positive romantic relationship really that she has um, across uh, the whole movie, ar- arguably. Um, so I quite liked that aspect. But for me, it just didn't sit right. The fact that there was such an emphasis on the visualization, maybe like you said, Tony, if they'd gone kind of almost more surreal and more obscure and if it had been even more open to artistic um, interpretation, then that could have worked. But I just I couldn't help but feel that this constant objectification and emphasis on the image and on the cinematography with it just came this dehumanization and I just thought that it didn't work because Marilyn Monroe as we kind of you know uh, touched on in the you know um, first part or part of this recording she has constantly been reduced to just what she looks like and this image of her um, whether she's like you know posing laughing or in some kind of you know suggestive positions and stuff so I didn't think it worked because it's Marilyn that we're talking about and there's kind of an there's something undermining about all that as for you know her uh, the actress Anna de Armas being you know um 
uh, used in sequences such as, um, you know, the Diamonds Are a Girl's Best Friend and stuff like that worked for me personally. I, I don't think that it's taking away from, you know, Marilyn Monroe or anything. Um, it kind of, uh, you know, does emphasize how, you know, um, immersed Anna de Armas was in this role and everything. But I think it would have been very disorientating almost if we suddenly saw actual Marilyn Monroe and I think it would have maybe undermined Anna to Armas's performance ultimately. So I think that the choice to 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 recreate those sequences with Anna de Armas was ultimately to the film's mm. betterment, I think anyway. Yeah, no, I thought technically they were they were pulled off really well. Um I think what was interesting there is you get the sense, don't you, of the distance between what Marilyn has created. So the film the film's Marilyn, the film the film's version of Marilyn. What she, the distance between what she has done through her work and what she feels. So there's one scene, isn't there, you know, when she's watching one of her films and it cuts to her and she's saying like, oh, for this, you killed your baby. So I felt like the film, though, was too close to take, you know, that, that's Marilyn, the character expressing that view. But I felt like the film itself lacked curiosity and interest in her work uh, to some extent. So again, to go back to the Elvis comparison I made, uh, was it yesterday in yesterday's podcast? Um, it's, it's, there are some ways in which this film is similar to that one, but it's also very dissimilar. So, um, I think what Lerman did with Elvis was he managed to find a contemporary way to really put across the power of Presley as a performer. I think the focus is very different here, isn't it? Cause Dominic's, um, by his own admission is not particularly that interested in Marilyn Monroe's films, which he thinks nobody watches anymore. And I think you could sort of feel that coming through. So he would recreate these films beautifully. And then undercut them, whether it's from cutting uh, cutting from Marilyn performing to her ranting at Billy Wilder or whatever, you know. So, um, yeah, no, I did, I did think the actual sort of technical stuff there is very seamless and it worked quite well. But I think there's there are broader issues about the way he was engaging with Monroe's films, I think, her work. So, I mean, if, if we were to, to sort of finish, to sort of begin to wrap this up then, I mean, what what do we think this film is doing what what do we think it's for you know is it is it fitting in a certain i mean obviously it's adapting a novel sure but i think that 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 novel is is a good couple of decades old it's Mm -hmm. not something everyone's going to have read is this film attempting to fit like like you've said d within that me too landscape is it is that just a, a byproduct given the fact this this was began this project began before me too really started in the middle of the uh, roughly in the middle of the 2010s and is that just a coincidence ultimately to what this is about you know it seems to be that there there are you know i i wrote a little bit about this and i think we talked about this recently on our other podcast the discourse carl and i about mm-hmm. how there seems to be this year quite a few films that are dealing with um toxic masculinity in various different format forms and styles things like don't worry darling or men from alex garland things like this is it is this part almost of a, of a genre now, a subgenre of films that lean into horror, actually, as you said earlier, Carl, in order mm. to depict the dehumanization of women and and, and the, these in, in these kind of environments? It's interesting how Don't Worry Darling itself has a 50s tether as it too, you know, in that it's almost like that this, the 50s, although in many ways it, it's it's considered to be you know, the birthplace of rock and roll and, you know, the post-war transformation. You know, it has this resonance of this masculine toxicity and this abuse. And I know it's not just the 50s, this film set, but this, this was what I'm getting at. Is this what the film is doing? Is this what Dominic's trying to look at? Or are, are, is, is, the, is there less there than that? You know, and are, are, is that a generous, you know, approach there in terms of that? What do you think, Dee? Oh, there was one other point. Remind me after this, I'll, I'll go back to it. There was one other point I wanted to bring up about... Um, the movie, which I thought was uh, uh, quite interesting and actually touches on what you're saying there in that. Is this intentionally done or not? But I just find it quite interesting. Um, but regards to what the film is doing overall in relation to the Me Too movement and actually um, just touching on, because you mentioned a few movies there, I'd actually also add One Night in Soho to that list. Edgar Wright's movie. Oh, Last Night in Soho, yeah. Because I... Mm. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Last night in Soho, because yeah. I think that that is another movie that touches on yeah. all of that. And I think all Absolutely. the flashbacks there also set in the fifties, aren't they? Around that Six, era, around 50s, that, 60s. Think, yeah. the fifties, sixties. Oh, okay. Yeah. So yeah, same, yeah. same era, roughly, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Roughly, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And that is also a essentially a horror movie. So, um, I yeah, I think that that's another movie you could kind of put in that category. So certainly there is a movement of these types of movies 
coming out now. And I think that that's really uh, interesting. And I think that it's something that, um, you know, we've needed to look at for the long time, uh, for a long time. And that's um, something that I've always kind of appreciated about um, movies in the way that they can, you know, react to what's happening in like the contemporary era. Um, but they're also so like readily accessible for people to, you know, watch them and just think about these wider issues or to just like watch them for what they are. Um, to be honest, I oh, I'd, I'd have to read more interviews with Andrew Dominic, I feel, because I don't know if that was his intention or was his intention to do this kind of psychoanalytic study of Marilyn Monroe. I couldn't actually write down in a sentence exactly what he was trying to accomplish and whether he did accomplish that. And I think that that's part of the problem that I find with this movie in that ultimately it just left me feeling a bit cold and yeah, and 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 just sad. <laughs> and but I but I kind of already knew that her life was horrible. This just extended that. And I also found it a bit frustrating in that certain elements were so true to what happened and then others were exaggerated. And I think that when you exaggerate to that extent, sometimes it can undermine everything else that is true and that did really happen. So I find that kind of ultimately quite frustrating. So I'm not exactly sure what um, Andrew Dominic was trying to do with this movie. And I'm I'm a bit kind of annoyed by that. Ultimately, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I would I'd like to see, to be honest with you, having seen this movie, I almost feel like I'd like to see someone else attempt a Marilyn Monroe biopic in a different kind of way. And I'd also like to see uh, uh, maybe what a female director would have to say and if they would maybe identify different elements of the story, you know, like we touched on, such as her relationship with Stradberg, such as her, you know, founding her own uh, production company and really that back and forth in terms of, you know, contracts and what she was getting paid, because those are the kind of issues that I would have liked to see, because I suppose those are the kind of um, issues that are that were, you know, so pressing to women back then and are still so um, pressing to women today. I just think that that stuff might have been a bit more... Um, interesting to see as well. I'm just I'm surprised that for a movie that was nearly three hours long at how much was ultimately left out. And I'm a bit frustrated by that, to be honest. I almost feel like do we need um, maybe a series based on her or something? Maybe that maybe that's what we need is more time um, to delve um, into her life and all the intricacies of it, because um, I don't think it was all bleak and all horror. And that's what this movie kind of turns it into ultimately. Yeah. I suppose I thought, when talking about um, is it very timely in regards to Me Too and things like that, and of course on one level it is. On the other hand, um, like we say, the book is 20-odd years old. I think that's what's very interesting about the book, is it's very clear-sighted about things like the decadence of Hollywood and the the way Hollywood um, commodifies women and mistreats women. I, I felt the book kind of tapped into that um you know long long before the me too movement and in, in a really interesting way um and like i said earlier there's there are these kind of precursors with things like fire walk with me i think the problem in a way is that this is actually a very old idea about marilyn monroe i think you could go back 50 years and find this idea that she represented um the ultimate victim so i don't in the, on that level i don't think it's saying anything particularly new to be honest i think you can find biographies of monroe where this runs all the way through and so on. So it's a curious one for me. Um, I found myself, I like D, I find it quite hard to answer the question, who is this for? Like I said earlier, I do like that it's a weird director driven film that's made its way through the system and is getting a big prominent release at the same time as I, f I it mostly left me cold, I gotta say. But I, I get that. I understand that distance, I think, really. I think, I think I felt the same, really. I wasn't like I said, I didn't really enjoy it, but I, I I appreciate it though, and I think I I think I understand in some respects what it's trying to do. Having having read uh, purely having read the book, I think mm -hmm. if I hadn't read the book, I would be more at sea, really, and I think I would be, and and, and even with that context, I still didn't feel it particularly. I, it, it is bleak, it is hard, it is cruel, really. Um, but I do think it's 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 worth seeing, whether it's. It'd be really interesting to see the legacy this film has, and if it's if it gets a different approach in time. Once all the 
the quite reactionary rhetoric has died down. And if people start to see in it different things, which is usually what happens with most films, particularly ones that are auteur driven like this, I think that, that, you know, time and distance will change the way people look at it. And it'll be really interesting to see what happens a lot in those lines, but we won't know yet. Yeah. I, oh yeah. I was going to. Oh yeah. Uh, D, yeah. What was your oh, point? Sorry. Yeah. No, go for it. Yeah. 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 So, no, no, no. Just before um, we uh, detract too much, just the very last thing I was going to bring up about Blonde. And again, I'm not sure if uh, this was intentional or not, but I did find it really interesting how it ended up um, engaging with the kind of uh, pro-choice um, idea, because particularly in America, that is such a huge um, conversation at the moment uh, with Roe versus Wade, which is pretty horrendous what's going on right now. But I just thought it was really interesting how um, it wasn't just one scene, but it was like a recurring thing, because I think that's another thing that's quite well known about Marilyn is the fact that she did, um, you know, suffer miscarriages. And I think that one of them actually was was um, meant to be around the time of uh, some like it hot, which kind of in part led to her uh, quite um you know, erratic behaviour on the on the set of that movie. But I just thought that it was really kind of uh, beautifully and tragically uh, depicted, you know, how, you know, with um, her 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 abortion, how she does change her mind and then she's kind of made go through with it. Um, and you do hear this about, you know, the, the Hollywood studio system in that, you know, if, if you know, these um, actresses were under contract to, you know, um, film certain movies that they were made to, you know, um, have those procedures, which is really horrific. And then, you know, the the way that it was depicted when she, you know, got pregnant and she wanted the baby and she lost the baby. I thought that that was really tragic. And then I also thought it was really interesting, um, the whole possible notion, because, again, this is something that's been hinted at, but never actually my understanding is it's been hinted at and never actually confirmed the whole idea that she was um, impregnated by Kennedy and made have an abortion. I thought the movie was interesting that it, it, it depicted that idea almost as if she was having some kind of fever dream or delusion. But the fact that it's still there and that idea is something that could have may have happened, I thought was also quite interesting. And I'd imagine there was probably a bit of backlash about that as well. But I just thought that... Um, it was interesting how it engaged with that idea because I think it was in one of the articles um, you sent on, Tony, wasn't there that whole idea that um, Marilyn was kind of, you know, really upset about the fact that she couldn't have a child, that that almost like took away from her femininity because, you know, that instinct to be, you know, maternal, to be a mother is also a part of um being a woman but then the fact that she never had children I suppose also kind of you know kept her status in a way as like this sex symbol you know that she was this sexy woman that you didn't have to worry about realities like impregnation and stuff like that so I just think that that's um, interesting because I do think that that's a really you know big part of who Marilyn was as well her experience with um, abortion and with uh, miscarriages so I'm, I'm glad the film touched on that and I think that it that was one of the aspects of the film I thought was probably handled a bit a bit in a bit more interesting a way than maybe other aspects of the movie. There's some um, there's some American coverage, isn't there, that see the film as being anti-abortion. I saw a Breitbart uh, headline, which was about sort of saying, like, despite its pro-life message, um, this is a hard film to watch or something. So I don't know. I didn't watch the film and come away from it thinking that he was specifically trying to make a comment about the rights and wrongs of abortion. Um, but maybe you're right, the in the sense that because American discourse on that topic is so polarised, maybe that uh, American audiences will sort of um, think of it more readily in those terms. I don't know. I suppose those sequences had, um, there's the two shots in the film, aren't there, from within Marilyn Monroe's uh, vagina, I suppose, um, kind of perspective shots. Um, so I, I could think I could see what he was yeah, trying to do horrible. there. I thought they were horrible. Yeah, I thought that... Um, I could see the point that he's sort of trying to say, look, this is a woman whose body was kind of dissected and offered up for consumption in certain ways at the same time as it being quite a ghoulish touch. So again, it's that kind of mixed impulse I'm finding with this film, but it's kind of trapped between two things, really. Trapped between two spheres. I don't know. I don't know. It's interesting to hear Diarmas talk about how she she had real trust with Andrew Dominic, I think. And she said, there are things I would have done this isn't an exact quote, but she said, there are things I've, I did on this film that I would never have done with any other director in my career. And I think 
not just the the blowjob scene, for instance, which is one I suspect she's talking about, but maybe these kind of moments as well that really get into, you know, the, I mean, I know they haven't literally gone in and, and opened up her vagina, for instance, but it's that whole, the depiction of what she's, of, of what she goes through here. I think there's a lot there that she, that really, that she really pushed herself with an actress to do. And I think, I'm really glad you brought this up, Dee, actually, because this is a massive part of the film and, and the book, actually, in terms of how she how she deals with motherhood and the loss of these 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 miscarriages and these I think ectopic pregnancies and things like this, and I mean the 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 Kennedy baby thing. I mean that's for me that whole sequence is straight out of something like the X Files. It's that whole idea of being abducted by sinister government men and 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 you know uh, they they put you into a sleep and make you think it's a dream. You know it's 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 really strange conspiracy theory stuff. That and the film of, avoids going into the conspiracy theory realms about her death, you know, in the way that um, a lot of the myths circulate. But it's really important to, I think, touch on this because it is so important to not just the daddy issue kind of aspect of her psychology, but the fact that that not being a... You know, because her mother's a very key part of this story as well. The fact that she's... Her mother is, is this paranoid schizophrenic who is abusive when she's a child. And then she, con- and then she basically keeps her in in a home for, for years. She has to go into a psychiatric unit and Marilyn pays for it for years and tries to go back to her. And, and her mother just never is constantly, you know, she never gives her any love at all. And, and so that is so important to the way she, that the complex person that Norma Jean was in relation to the confection that Marilyn was, the idea of this created part that she never was, you know, is so important. So I'm really, I, I, I almost can't believe we missed that. So thanks Steve for bringing that up because that's, it's really important part of it really. So let's finish then with the question that I ask everybody uh, that is usually related more to politics, but the politics has sort of been skirting the edges of this episode, which is much more history based and, and, and cinema based. But um, would you, in terms of whether the film is good or bad or in the middle, would you vote the film in or out, or would you uh, spoil your ballot, basically? <laughs> would you go in the middle? Mm. So, um, Dee, what about you first? What would you say? This is a really hard one because I agree with both of you guys in that I, I feel like I've been quite harsh. But um, I, I do think that it's still a movie worth watching and for everyone to, you know, form their own opinions about I feel kind of split down the middle. I think that in my typical, not very interested in politics fashion, (laughs) I might end up spoiling my ballot because I do feel torn in that, um, like I said, the movie left me cold. I do think that it is too bleak. I think that it's, it's, it's too long. And yet at the same time, didn't really touch on a lot of um, the aspects of Marilyn's life, which I would have liked to maybe have seen. So, yeah, I think I'm split down the middle. I think I'm going to have to spoil my ballot. But at that, I would say I think it is worth everyone seeing just once. But just make sure you you're emotionally ready for it. Mm. Yeah, I find myself like the kind of with mixed feelings on this vote. Tony, I've got to say, um, I also feel like I've been much harsher than I expected to be when I woke up this morning <laughs> about this film. Um, <laughs> yeah, as, as I kind of thought about it overnight, I think my, my view has hardened on it. I'm going to vote it in because there are so many people out there who are saying you must not watch this film and i think that's a ridiculous position to take i'm gonna say that if you've if you're going to choose to watch this film you need to be aware that this is not a um a biography you know there are other places to find out exactly about what marilyn monroe's life was like i'm voting it in on the basis that it's a good thing that we have got big films out there swinging for the fences effectively However, I'm not voting it in because I think this is a great film, because I really don't think that. And like I say, although it's got virtues, it mostly left me cold. So I'm still going to vote for it, though. Yeah, me too, I think, on that basis, in that I think I think it's worth watching. I think we've got to let the time and distance give us a, a perspective, like I said earlier, about what this is. But I definitely wouldn't vote it out. I think, I think, I think it should be seen, I think, it will spur conversation. It could be part of something bigger that we can't quite see yet. It's not a great movie. I agree. It is a cold movie. It is a hard movie. It's a bleak movie. Um, but Diarmas is excellent. You know, it, it, in what she gives, it's worth it for her alone, really, to to see what she does. So yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. It's uh, is it fascinating to watch? Fascinating to to read a lot about her life as well and and get more into this. So. 
Uh, I, I've really enjoyed this chat. Thank you, guys. It's it's been really it, it's been really interesting, and informative. So um, so yeah. Uh, why don't we finish then by briefly uh, plugging where we can find out about more of what we're doing. D at the top, you talked about the podcast you're on and things like that. But where can people get a bit more information about you and uh, and and find what you're up to? I mean, Twitter is kind of my go to platform for um, you know, sharing all the podcasts and radio segments I participate in and generally just chat and movies. Yeah. <laughs> I quite, I quite, I quite like the film Twitter community actually. So, um, yeah. uh, you know, when, when it's not being like mean <laughs> and toxic, but I've done very well to just surround myself yeah. with, with positive people, uh, which you can't do. You just yeah. have to work that algorithm right. So, <laughs> um, so on Twitter, I'm at Deirdre Malumbi, all one word, uh, Deirdre, D-E-I-R-D-R-E, Malumbi, M-O-L-U-M-B-Y. Fan- fantastic. We'll uh, make sure you go and look up everything Dee's doing, guys, because it's great. Carl. Why don't you... Uh, I mean, people know this already, probably, because you've been on a few yeah, times. Just why don't you remind me? Very people? quickly. Well, cheers, Tony, anyway, for having having me on again. Um, I apologise for referring to Joyce Carol Oates' book so much, but in my defence, I read all 800 pages of it on holiday, so I was determined to get some <laughs> mileage out of that. Um, same, same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at CKJ Sweeney. You can find uh, the Movie Palace podcast at Movie Palace Pod. And as you know, Tony, uh, just started recording new episodes of said podcast, which is exciting after a bit of a hiatus. Um, hoping to do a Marilyn Monroe film itself at some point, actually, as a bit of a counterbalance to this blonde discourse. So, yep, those are the two main places you can find me and that podcast on Twitter. Fantastic, fantastic. Well, you can find me at AJ Black Writer on Twitter for uh, links to everything I'm doing, including my uh, upcoming new book, uh, The Cinematic Connery, uh, the films of Sir Sean Connery, um, which is coming out very soon as you listen to this. Uh, And uh, you can find more on that at culturalconversation.co.uk, my website, and more generally on uh, the We Made This Network at we underscore made this on Twitter and um, we made this on Facebook, we made this network.com for all the other podcasts we're doing, including the discourse, um, which Carl and I are doing. Um, which is uh, looking at all new new kinds of things. And we will be talking a little bit more about Blonde and some of the discourse around Blonde on that. So that will be coming out very soon when you listen to this or it might be out already. So do check out check us out at Pod the Discourse for uh, for what for more on that, really. So, um, so yeah, thanks again, guys. Please, as I said at the top, please subscribe to Partisan and give us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. And if you do want to help out We Made This more broadly, please uh, consider supporting us on Patreon if you go to patreon.com forward slash we made this. Blonde, however, is not all we're chatting about on the network, so we'll give you a taste of what else is going on on the network in just a moment. But uh, until next time on Partisan, we will talk more about uh, politics and history in film and entertainment. Bye for now, and we'll see you next time. Hello, and this is Frame to Frame, part of the We Made This Podcast Network. We are a podcast that take two seemingly unconnected films and slam them together with the most obscure theme that we can find. I'm Andy Williams. And I'm Sean Wilson. And every Wednesday, you'll be able to find out a little bit more about the different themes and different films that we look into. You can hear moments such as this. Gwyneth Paltrow has as many Oscars as David Cronenberg. That's just wrong in every sense of the word. Um, Yeah, but you can't get a candle that smells like David Cronenberg. No, wait, I'm not going to get there. Um, (laughs) No, no, don't, don't do that. I mean, we've we've done nearly ten minutes on why you dislike Zack Snyder, and that was just the first the first person that I mentioned as as a, a, a talented name. In the, the now film. you've got you've got to make get, take us in a positive direction, please. Okay, <laughs> Jared Butler is the lead of this film. Oh, that's not a good start. <laughs> that's, that's really not a good start. At all. Keep going. <laughs> I just want to say, Emma, I really I really love your philosophy about no matter how good or bad a movie is there's a lot of effort that goes into it <laughs> I, re- I really like that philosophy because I find myself grappling with that it's kind of like it's really easy to tear something down because the finished product that comes out in the cinema or on streaming is nominally bad but it has actually had a fair amount of effort that went into it regardless exactly. of how that's planned be sure to check your podcast app of choice every Wednesday to find new episodes you'll be able to like subscribe and find us on social media at frame to frame pod 